the making of a king's bride. In our last episode, we stepped into the world of Akashverosh, in which there was a six-month world fair, at the end of which a seven-day feast. This was displaying all the glory, all the wealth of the empire of Akashverosh, which is uh, most likely Xerxes, which spanned all the way to the Indus River in India, all the way back to Ethiopia, right up to Greece. And we see that at the end of this world fair, at the end of this culminating event, he asked his most beautiful bride, his wife, his queen, to have the royal crown put on her, and then that she would come before uh, her husband and the entire gala celebration. Her, his wife, Queen Vashti, then despised her husband and insulted her husband in front of everyone. And it was at that point that all of the rulers of the empire were all together and they said, this cannot stand. If this word goes out that Vashti has insulted, that she has degraded the emperor in front of everyone, it is gonna be complete mayhem in the entire empire. So they gave the counsel and it was written in the law of the Medes and the Persians that cannot be changed, that Vashti would be removed from being queen, and that at that point, a decree went out to the entire empire that men should bear rule in their house, that they should be respected in their homes. The queen was loved, but the queen didn't respect her husband, and so then Vashti was put out. And so the Vash vanquishing of Vashti is what we covered last week. And then we started into chapter two of Esther, and this is where we're going to pick it up at this time. So please take your Bibles and turn to Hadassah, or Esther, chapter two, and we're gonna step back just a little bit from where we were last episode and read. And after these things, when the wrath of the king, Akashverosh, which means if I remain silent, I will become poor, uh, his wrath was appeased. He remembered Vashti and what he had done and what was decreed against her. And then the king's servants that ministered unto him said, let there be fair young virgins sought for the king. And let the king appoint officers in all the provinces of the kingdom that they may gather together all the fair young virgins unto Shushan the palace to the house of the women under the custody of Hege, the king's chamberlain, keeper of the women. And this is a time that there is a great deal of heartache in the empire because the, the king is looking for a bride. And so he has men go out and he is looking for the most beautiful women, the most beautiful virgins in all of the empire. Now, these are the, the fairest of all the land. And so you know that from a youth that the parents of other young men have had their eye on Hadassah and all these other women that are out there. And, and there are plans that are being made. Weddings have already been planned years, decades in advance. And, and now we, we see that these young virgins are being taken away from their homes, taken away from the young men that love them, that are parent, planning on marrying them, and there is hardship. There are tears throughout the kingdom. Everyone is upset because they spend one night, one night with the king, and then they go into the house of the concubines, and they will never, ever see another man in their life. They're going to be kept by eunuchs and by maidens. They're gonna have all their needs taken care of, but if the king doesn't want them anymore, that's the last time that they see them. And so all their hopes and dreams for a family and, and, and all just vanish if they are selected. And so last week, as we were talking about this and, and going back into the, the old Arabic uh, fable, A Thousand and One Nights, or A Thousand and One Arabian Nights, as it's become known, uh, we, we get a little bit of a picture of what this is like. And yet, these girls aren't going to be executed the next morning, like in the tale of A Thousand and One Nights, but their life is over. And so now, we see that this is the commandment that's gone throughout the empire, and it says that 
And verse four, let the maiden which pleases the king, excuse me, we'll back up, and uh, let there be things given to her for her purification, and then let the maiden that pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti, which means ravishing beauty, or trophy wife. And the king, the thing pleased the king, and he did so. Now, we pick it up where we left off last time, now in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordechai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Now this is very important. See, genealogies in the Bible and all these names of who begat who, the first time that you read through the scriptures, you know, you don't have to pay a, a whole lot of attention to it. You don't have to get encumbered with, with a lot of these things because you need to read through the scriptures over and over and over again anyway. And the first time, these names will mean absolutely nothing to you. But these do mean something because first of all, we, we see that it, it was the, uh, the Mordecai, the son of Yair, the son of Shimei, who was the son of Kish. Now, wait just a minute, a Benjamite. This is Kish. I'm gonna take you back to 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter nine, verse one. Now there was in the days, uh, uh, a, a, excuse me, there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish, the son of Aviel, the son of Zavor, the son of Berakot, the son of Fafia, a Benjamite, a man of power, and he had a son whose name was Shaul a good choice young man and a goodly man. And there was not among the children of Israel a goodlier person than he. From his shoulders and upwards, he was higher than all the people. He could put out his arms. Everyone in the land of Israel could walk underneath his arms. He was that big. Now we see that Mordecai is of this lineage. He is, it says, the, the son of Kish, but there are like 480 years, just dozens of generations between Kish and, and, and Saul and finally Mordecai. But Mordecai was almost royalty. And why I say almost royalty, let, let's, let's continue on in 1 Samuel. We're gonna go to chapter 15 because this is very important to understand for the story of of Esther or Hadassah to make sense. In 1 Samuel chapter 15, verse one, Samuel said unto Saul, the king, Yehovah sent me to anoint you to be king over this people, over Israel. Now therefore, hearken unto the voice of the words of Yehovah. Thus saith Yehovah Tzavot, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid in wait for him in, a way when he, in the way when he came out from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek, utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep and camel and ass. Now you ask yourself, why be so ruthless? Well, first of all, when we're coming out of Egypt, it tells us that the Amalekites attacked from the rear, attacked the, the, uh, the infirm and the women and the children. They were absolute bloodthirsty, mirthless, merciless cowards. Much of what we see happening in the land of Israel today, we see uh, suicide bombers, homicide bombers, go into like women's and children's shoe stores and go into Passover seders and go where people are completely unprotected. They, they don't go and literally do combat with those who are worthy of doing combat with. No, they look for little babies and women and children. As a matter of fact, in Nablus, and why it's called Nablus is because the, the Arabs can't uh, pronounce a P. It's, it was Neapolis, Neapolis or New City, or the ancient uh, city of Shechem. They actually have a display there, which is partially funded by the United Nations, I believe. And this whole display is a museum which shows the Sabaro restaurant that a bomber went in and blew all these women and children up, and so now they have a museum showing these dismembered babies and women that are all torn apart, and a few men that are in there with blood and guts splattered all over the place, and they go in there, it's a place of celebration. See, they, they, they have a new nomenclature or a name, but ladies and gentlemen, these are the same Amalekites. They were renamed Palestinians by the United Nations 50 years ago, but you see the same thing going on. And this is why the Almighty said, get rid of them. 
Now let's take a look, let's get a little bit deeper into this, because in Numbers 14, 25, it says, now the Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelt in the valley. What valley is it speaking of? We now know it as the Great Rift Valley or the Dead Sea Valley, but what was going on among the Canaanites down in that valley? See, to understand why these people had to be taken out, by the command of the Almighty, and Saul was told to do this as king, is because these are some very perverse, sick, twisted people that as long as they are allowed freedom, they will continue to torture, maim, and kill uh, individuals. And so to understand, these Amalekites and the Canaanites dwelling together, so now, whatever these Canaanites are into, the Amalekites now get into down in the Dead Sea Valley. Remember, Sodom, Gomorrah, Adma, Zeboim, Okay, those four cities destroyed by fire and brimstone because of the gross sexual perversion that these people were into. Canaanites. Well, where did the Canaanites go back to? All we have to do is take a look back at Genesis. And in Genesis chapter nine, we read where Noah, after the flood, planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and was drunken when he was, and he was uncovered in his tent. It doesn't say by whom he was uncovered, and then it says, and Ham, the father of the Canaan, of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, told his two brethren without, Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on their shoulders, went backward and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Now, wh- why does it say Ham, the father of Canaan? First of all, it says the sons of Ham were Cush, Mitzrayim, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. Canaan was the youngest, or in biblical uh, English, uh, the younger of the sons of Ham. And so right here it tells us that Ham, who was the father of Canaan, was the one that discovered this. He went and saw this and went out and told his brothers. His brothers went in and took care of the, of the situation. And when Noah awoke, it says in verse 24 of Genesis 9, when he awoke, he knew what his younger son had done unto him. Whose younger son? Not Noah's younger son, but Ham's younger son. Who is Ham's younger son? It's Canaan. See, Ham is not Noah's younger son. Shem is the younger or youngest son of Noah. Japheth is the eldest. But when he saw what Ham's younger son did unto him, he said, cursed be Canaan. He cursed him. And we see that the Canaanites take the, the, that which they are, and they are cursed for this, and they take it over into the land uh, which... Israel is eventually going to be deeded through Abraham. And it is rampant with sexual perversion, with sun god worship. They take when the Tower of Babel transpires and this pagan sun god worship is scattered all over the earth. It's the Canaanites, the offspring of Canaan, who with their sexually perverse world take it over to this land, and they're squatting on the land. They were not given this land. They're squatting on the parcel of land through which all the trade routes go through, where the Almighty has already decided. He has already divided up the nations according to the number of the sons of Israel. He has scattered them at the Tower of Babel, 70 nations, and he's going to choose one nation, the sons of Israel, to be his priests, to be his prophets, and he's going to put them in the trade routes of all the world so that they can be priests and kings to the entire world, so that they can reconcile the world to God. See, at the Tower of Babel, the Almighty did the world a favor, confused the languages, Babylonian sun god worship was spread out through the world. The sexual perversion of Canaan was then isolated, and the Almighty said, I'll take care of these sexual perverts later. You know, by the time you have a sexual perversion named after your city, Sodom, or Sodomy, you know it's a bad place. You know, it's slavery, uh, pedophilia. Uh, the, these are the people that, that originated uh, kidnapping people and using them as sex slaves, okay? This is what is going on. And then they would just murder them. 
Same thing that's going on in a lot of countries today. As a matter of fact, that is what our, our president, Theodore Roosevelt, had to deal with with the Barbary pirates. They were kidnapping Americans over there, the Barbary pirates, the Muslim pirates, and they were selling people for sex slaves and, uh, and, and then, of course, trying to get money for their release. And, and other governments were paying millions of dollars every year for this very thing, to get their citizens released. Finally, Teddy Roosevelt said, enough. We are sending the Marines to the shores of Tripoli, and we're gonna take care of this. But he said, this isn't the end. We're gonna have to deal with them again. And unfortunately, we're dealing with them again. They run planes in the World Trade Center. They, you know, they, just all sorts of sick stuff is going on through the sons of Canaan and the Amalekites. So now you understand why Shaul was told, you get rid of every last one of these people because they are murderers. They will continue doing what they've always done. Now we're going to continue on a little bit further in, into this because now we see that uh, um, the, the background of Mordecai is Saul. That means his cousin, Hadassah, is almost royalty. And, uh, and the almost royalty goes a long ways here, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to see exactly how that, uh, uh, how that plays out. Now, we're going to go into verse 6. And uh, Mordecai, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, the, uh, the king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. And he brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, as it says. Uh, He brought up Hadassah, that is Esther. Now, why is she going to be named Esther? Well, we're going to find out about that in verse 10. But her her Hebrew name is Hadassah. Uh, The pagan name that she will be given, for good reason, is Esther, or Easter. It is literally Easter, and remember, we're in Babylon. So we're going to touch on that in just a minute. And it says that Mordecai was his his uncle's daughter. So uh, that means that Hadassah is Mordecai's cousin. For she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful, whom Mordecai, when when her father and mother were dead, took his cousin for his own daughter. In verse 8, So it came to pass, when the king's commandment and his decree was heard, and when many maidens were gathered together unto Shushan the palace, to the custody of Haggai, that Hadassah was brought also unto the king's house, to the custody of Haggai, keeper of the women. This is completely out of her control, out of Mordecai's control. Nobody can do anything about this. Nothing can be done about this. Now, she will never have another man in her, in her life, and she is destined now to live forever in the court of the king. And the maiden pleased him. And this is Haggai, the keeper of the women. The maiden pleased him, and she obtained kindness of him, and he speedily gave her things for purification with such things as belonged to her and seven maidens. So there was something about this girl that was so special. Her intellect, her beauty, and her, the, the, the standard by which this woman lived because she was raised in a house of a Jew. She was raised to respect her cousin who was taking care of her. He was, she was obedient to him, and we will see, just as she would have been to her parents. She respected and obeyed Mordecai. And so uh, there was something about this, the, the respect, the intelligence, the absolute knock down, dead, just beauty of this woman. Everything about her was so absolutely superb that he gave her everything that she needed, and seven maidens. And it says he preferred her and her maids to the best place of the house of the women. He gave her the very best. Hadassah had not showed, in verse 10, Hadassah had not showed her people nor her kindred uh, because Mordecai had charged her that she should not show it. 
Now we understand why her name, when she goes in to the court of the king, to the chamber where Haggai is going to then groom her and get her ready to meet the king, that her name is no longer Hadassah. It's Easter. Well, see, you, you, you've got to give her a good name, and she has to be able to live up to this. Now, who is Easter, first of all? Well, we have to go all the way back to ancient Babylon before the confusion of languages when Nimrod was worshiped as a god. Well, what happened is that Nimrod was killed, his body was hacked into little pieces, spread throughout the land of Shinar, which should have effectively ended the worship of Nimrod. But no, his wife, Semiramis, not willing to let the kingdom slip through her fingers so easily, said that Nimrod really didn't die, he's ascended up into heaven and has now become the sun god. And so, Semiramis appointed priests, priest, mathematicians, magicians, who would be the ones who would develop the worship of Nimrod as a sun god. They are the mathematicians that divided the year into four quadrants, winter solstice, summer solstice, the vernal and autumnal equinoxes, the shortest day of the year, the longest day of the year, and the years in the spring and fall of equal daylight and equal darkness. Winter solstice, summer solstice, vernal autumnal equinox, amen. And so now, they put in place the worship of the sun. December 25th was the winter solstice on the ancient Babylonian calendar before the procession of the equinoxes, which brings us to around December 20th to 21st today. But December 25th, that's when it all started. The rebirth of the sun, this is when Nimrod ascended, uh, you know, uh, was ascended into heaven. And in fact, the son of Nimrod, the reborn sun god, Tammuz, going to be born on December 25th. That's a little bit in the future. So now what happens is that Semiramis is in charge of the kingdom. Everything is going well. She becomes pregnant much later. Not by way you might expect. No, the rays of the sun impregnated her. Her dead husband Nimrod now impregnated her, and she is going to bring forth her the reincarnated sun god, little baby Tammuz, on December 25th. Okay? And don't let that be a shock to you out there in the Christian world Think, oh, I thought that was Jesus' birthday. No, even the Pope knows better. And the Pope hardly knows anything. But even the Pope in his latest book said that that's nonsense, okay? Well, you know, you have all of the, the, uh, the, the pagan gods, from Zeus to Jupiter to, uh, to Ra to Tammuz to Mithra, all born on December 25th, because it all goes back to Babylonian sun worship. Now, what happened is that Semiramis finally dies. She ascends up into the heavens. The gods send her back to the earth in a giant egg, which plummets into the Euphrates River on the first Sunday after the vernal equinox. The egg bursts open, and out emerges Semiramis, reincarnated as Easter, the bare-breasted sex goddess who turns a bird into an egg-laying rabbit. That's why now in America they have this Playboy magazine. And what is it? It's the goddess of fertility. It's a sex goddess. What's the symbol? It's a bunny rabbit. It's an egg-laying rabbit. It goes right straight back to Babylon, ladies and gentlemen. Now, what better name for this Jewish girl who's going to be taken into the court of the king than the name that is revered by all of the pagan sun god worshipers, Easter? And there's already a feast that's already set for Easter, and we're going to see that they're going to dedicate that and have the feast of Easter for Hadassah, who's been renamed Easter in a little bit. So now, we, we go on. And, and so we see Mordecai, in verse 11, walked every day before the court of the women's house to know how Hadassah did and what should become of her. And when every maid's turn was come to go into King Akashverosh, after that they had been 12 months, according to the manner of women. For so were the days of their purification accomplished. To wit, six months with oil of myrrh, six months with sweet odors, and with other things for the purifying of the women. Now, this 12-month program, this is what it takes in the making of a king's bride. Every woman in the kingdom would trade her hopes and dreams for family, for friends, 
for living the, the way that her parents and grandparents had lived, to lead the community and be completely separated uh, for the rest of her life. Not that many of them were that excited about it. And so you can imagine the state of these milkmaids out there that were selected to be groomed for one night with the king. In the course of this, we can only imagine that, uh, uh, you know, these, these girls that wanted to stay out of it, you know, they let themselves go a little bit. First of all, we're talking about country girls, okay? Uh, they're, they're not wearing high-heeled shoes and prancing around town with the latest jewelry, okay? They, they are barefoot. They are milkmaids. They're working out in the fields. Their hands are cracked and rough. They smell like sheep and goats. Their feet are all calloused and gnarly. Their, their fingernails are, are, are used for sewing and for, for, for uh, you know, opening up pecans and everything else. They, they are working girls. It's a working class world out there. Everyone works except for the Jews seven days a week. It's the Jews who, who take off one day a week. Unless you are perhaps Hadassah, who is almost royalty, who lives in the capital of Shushan, you know, a lot of these girls were rough. And if they didn't really want that one night with the king and they really wanted to get married, you can imagine their hair. By the time that the king's men went around to choose them, their hair was probably looked like a rat's nest. Uh, you know, they, they, got, they got cow dung and sheep dung on their clothes. They, they looked like they'd just run, you know, been dipped in, a, in a, a, a pile of mud and pulled out again. You know, they, they want these people to just keep on going. I'm not willing to trade my life for one night with the king. And so now, you bring all these girls into the capital. And they've got one year. And it says, six months with oil of myrrh. Well, this isn't uh, something that, that is uh, particularly pleasant, ladies and gentlemen. Oil of myrrh. Oil of myrrh. Myrrh is the most uh, spoken of oil or fragrance or incense uh, in all the Bible. Even more than, than frankincense, myrrh is the most spoken of. In high dosages, it can be toxic. It's a very powerful essential oil. Uh, it's, uh, the therapeutic properties are, it's uh, anti-inflammatory, it's antimicrobial, it's an antifungal, it's also a sedative. This is what Yeshua was offered, vinegar, spoiled wine, and that's what you get. If you don't preserve it rightly, you get vinegar, nasty tasting vinegar with myrrh in it. This is a sedative. This is a painkiller that Yeshua was offered. This is not how it's going to be used for these girls, though. It is also excellent for gum and mouth disorders, for gingivitis and uh, perea and spongy gums and, and other things that, that people get in real life. On the skin, it's used uh, for boils, on skin ulcers, on chapped and uh, in cracked skin, ringworm, weeping wounds, eczema, and athlete's foot, or maybe milkmaid's foot. And how this is used, this antimicrobial, fungicidal, how it's used is that, that the, the feet are bathed in this, and the hands and the body are bathed in this, and then those responsible for getting these, this young virgin ready, they take a grinding stone, like you would, uh, like a mortar and pestle, like, you know, a, a rough pumice, and they will grind away those calluses. And when they grind away these calluses and this chapped dead skin and all, it's got to be antimicrobial, antifungal, because they could get infections if not, because they work on them, they grind it down, and it is painful. They bring it right to the point of bleeding to try to get rid of all these calluses and these gnarly fingernails and, and all. And this takes six entire months. You can, um, no, you can't imagine it. You've, uh, I think you'd have to go back in time to the mountains of, uh, of uh, 
you know, West Virginia or something, you know, a couple hundred years ago uh, to find people that, you know, with no shoes that, that actually worked hard enough so they would take six months just to start to get them cleaned up. It's painful. And getting ready to be the bride of the king is a painful process. And it's not just getting rid of, of the physical calluses. It's getting rid of the, the, the diction, the language, the, the cultural way that they're speaking in the area because you don't want to bring a hick into the, uh, into the court of the king. You don't want someone that uses improper Chaldean. They are going to, if they're going to be the bride of the king, they are going to represent the empire as Vashti, a seven-day feast with women, unlimited credit card uh, account. She could do anything she wanted. And when she threw a party, it was a party. I'll tell you, all the, all the rough edges were off this woman. She was groomed. She was schooled. And we see later that Hadassah is actually going to have a banquet, a two-day bank, banquet for the king. Do you think she was schooled in what the king's uh, going to want? Do you think she is going to serve him oysters on the half shell if he's keeping kosher? No, it's everything that you need to know to be the queen. And all these rough edges have got to be ground away. You've got to know your future husband. Very important. You have to know your future husband. And if you don't know him, you are going to be in trouble when it all comes down to it. Now, let's, uh, let, let's continue on with this right here. Because after six months of the process of myrrh, and that is grinding away, that is trimming down, and that is getting her in a state that is suitable, getting rid of her past. Now, she's gonna be groomed for the future. And so six months of sweet odors and things, other things for the purifying of the women, this is where she's going to be trained in the philosophies. She is going to be educated in what's going on in the palace. She's going to understand all the protocols, as we see later, that Hadassah knows that if she approaches the king not being called for it, she can be executed for it. See, these are all the things that these women have got to know, and it's going to take an entire year to be able to do that. Now, I want to talk about this for just a minute because there are, uh, there are things that, that we can equate to bring, being the bride of Messiah, okay? Now, I recognize, and you should too, that the bride of Messiah is a figure of speech. It's a figure of speech, and we see that in, uh, in Matthew 10, 24, Yeshua speaks of his followers as his disciples, as his trained one. And later, Yeshua speaks of his disciples as servants. Then we see that they're spoken of as friends. Uh, at, the, at this time when a king, Yeshua said, there was a certain king that made a marriage for his son. Now, some people say, because it says the word certain, that means there really was that particular king. Like, there was a certain man named Lazarus who laid at the, feet, uh, at the gate of a rich man. And there was a certain rich man. That means it was really true. No, no, it's, it is a particular, it is speaking a figure of speech. A king made, a, a certain king made a wedding for his son. And he sent out, people to invite everyone in uh, to, to the wedding. And finally, at the end, someone came in without a wedding garment, and he called them friend, friend. And he said, send him out into utter darkness, bind him hand and foot, there's going to be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. You know, to be called and not prepared, for many are called, but few are chosen, or uh, in, in uh, simple English, few choose to respond in an appropriate manner, we see that he throws these friends out who have been invited to this. So, you know, he refers to some of the, his followers as friends. But then in John 15, 5, Yeshua says, no, I'm not going to call you servants any longer. I'm going to call you friends. Uh oh, that sounds bad. He's calling us friend. The last time I heard the term friend, he was binding his hand and foot and throwing us into utter darkness. 
See, each one of these is a different picture. You can't lump it all together. Another time, he says, okay, I'm not gonna call you a servant anymore, I'm gonna call you friend. But then in Romans 1.1, Shaul says that Paul, Shaul, a servant of Yeshua Messiah. Oh, maybe Shaul didn't get the memo that we're not to be called servants anymore, but we're to be called friends, and so now we're gonna start the Quakers called friends. Wait, just a minute. I don't think John got the revelation either because in the opening of Revelation, it speaks of this is a revelation that Yeshua gave his disciples to then tell his servants the thing which must come to pass. And it was sent and signified by his servant, Doulos Yohanan. They were called Doulos or a bond slave, not just a servant, who does the orders of the master, but one has been set free and then becomes a bond slave by a choice. In Matthew 21, we're referred to as guests. In Ephesians 6, we're referred to as wrestlers, WWF wrestlers, no doubt. In, uh, in Matthew 5, it speaks of the kingdom of heaven being like unto 10 virgins, five wise virgins and five moros, or as we would say in English, five morons, okay? You want the the biblical usage of the word moron? There it is, five wise virgins and five moron virgins, all right? And then in Mark, we're called husbandmen or farmers. In 1 Corinthians, we're called, we are, it says, we are the body of Christ, King James. We are the body of Messiah. But then in Romans 7, 4, it says, by the body of Messiah, we have been delivered. Wait, does that mean that we are the body of Messiah and we delivered ourselves? No, it, no, again, these are different figures. They are different examples at different times. And this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen, is that people want to say, well, this group of people is the bride of Messiah. These people are the wedding guest. These people are the moron virgins. These people are, you know, these people are the soldiers. These people are the boxers. These people are the ambassadors. These people are the builders. Uh, uh, These people are the priests and kings. These people are the saints. No, you can't take all these metaphors, all these figures of speech, all these parables and mix them up and then redefine things completely outside of what the scripture is communicating. We are the bride of Messiah. But that's not all that we are. We are wrestlers. We're runners. We're fighters. We're builders. We're we're saints. We are guests. We're bond slaves. We're all these things. Keep it in context, people, and then it will all make sense. But in that motif of the making of the king's bride, we read in Revelation 19, 7, let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him for the marriage of the lamb has come. This is after the seven bowls of wrath are poured out and a cry goes out of the throne room, it is finished. The angel says, no one enters the Mishkan in heaven until the bowls of wrath are poured out and then at the end, it is finished. And then it says, the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife has made herself ready. And to her, it was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousnesses of the saints. As some versions have it, the righteous acts of the saints. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, the bride must come with the garments cleaned up not in the filthy, stinking garments of Babylonian paganism, or as a milkmaid, you don't come to the marriage supper of the Lamb just as I am. That's where you start, just as you are. Then, it is as long as it takes to get rid of the pagan sun god worship, to get rid of all these things that the scripture calls abominations. This is your responsibility. Oh, you'll be given some maids to help out. Some other people will say, you're, out of, you're off your rocker. You're completely out to lunch. You need to get cleaned up. 
Quit putting that phallic symbol Christmas tree in the front of your church. Get rid of the paganism. You want to get married to the lamb? You better hate the things he hates. You better love the things he loves. You better get ready. Because if you come in without your right garments on, you are going to be bound hand and foot and thrown into outer darkness. And I really don't think that that's what that parable is all about. I think that parable is saying, don't think you're going to show up in your stinking garments. You ain't getting in, period. And I'll tell you, there will be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth, the lost opportunities, because the righteous acts of the saints, salvation is of grace, works of, are of merit, and you don't get into the marriage supper of the Lamb just as you are. Jesus didn't do it all. He paid the price, the death penalty, and he says, now walk in me, learn of me. Understand who I am. Do my will. Do the Father's will. Get cleaned up. You do the work and I'm going to give you authority over 10 cities. You're going to be a king. You're going to rule as a king if you do what I ask you to do. Righteous acts of the saints, that's what the bride is adorned in. And you're not getting into the marriage supper without them. In Revelation 21, 2, it says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. New Jerusalem is not the bride. They're saying that New Jerusalem looks like a bride adorned for her husband. It's going to take us then nine more verses when an angel comes down and says, come, and I will show you the bride, the lamb's wife. Then it takes 18 more verses. It keeps on describing this city. And then finally, the inhabitants of the city who get to dwell with the lamb, the lamb's wife, now lives with them forever in this magnificent, majestic city. There's no way to describe the lamb's wife except those who have purged themselves from all of the things that are distasteful to the king. The making of the bride's wife. We have to know the bridegroom. We have to have our garments washed clean and white. The bridegroom said, do not think that I have come to destroy the Torah. In his first recorded public words, do not think for one second I've come to destroy the law. Greek nomos. Hebrew nomos is Torah. I didn't come to destroy the Torah of the prophets. I didn't come to destroy but fulfill. I'm gonna tell you that one jot, one title, one vowel and one consonant, as it says in the ancient Hebrew text of the Gospel of Matthew, not one vowel or consonant will pass from the Torah till all is fulfilled. Whoever breaks one of the least commandments in the Torah and teaches men to do so should be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Bound hand and foot if you please, okay? And then, then at the end of this very recitation, he says, not those, not those who call me Lord, not those who call me Lord are going to enter the kingdom. Those who do the will of my Father. I will profess to many who purport to follow me in that day, the many who called me Lord, depart from me. I never knew you. You who work, anomia. A without, nomos, Torah. You who are without Torah, out of here. I don't know you. Wow. You better get to know the king. You want to spend one, more than one night with the king, then you better get to know him. Let's continue on. Verse 13. Then thus came every maiden unto the king. Whatsoever she desired was given to her to go with her out of the house of women into the king's house. In the evening she went, and on the morrow she returned into the second house of the women. Now she is technically a concubine. No man will ever touch her. Up to this point, up to this night with the king, she could then be rejected, sent home. Oh, go marry Frank, down the street, okay? But now she's sent into the second house of the woman to the custodia of Sha'ashgaz, the king's chamberlain, 
which kept the concubines. She did not come into the king anymore, except the king delighted in her, and that she were called by name. He doesn't say, yeah, give me that one with the, uh, you know, with the, with the chestnut hair tonight. No, no, you get, he has to know her name, she has to be that important that, that he is, she is known by him. Now when the turn of Hadassah, the daughter of Avihael, which means the mighty, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her for his daughter, was come to go into the king, she required nothing but what Haggai, the king's chamberlain, the keeper of the women, appointed. And, and Easter, Easter, obtained favor in the sight of all that looked upon her. So Easter was taken into the house of Ashkosh into his house royal in the 10th month, which is in the month Tevet, in the seventh year of his reign. If you know what the month Tevet is, you need to get the astronomically and agriculturally correct biblical Hebrew calendar, because until you get your mind out of the pagan calendar that we inherited from Rome, in which every day of the month is, uh, 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 of the week is named after a pagan god, every month of the year named after a different pagan god, until you step back into the biblical reckoning of time, things like this will just, they'll just go by you. But it's the seventh year now, and she is called in after a year of preparation. And the king loved Hadassah above all the women. And she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So that he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. Then the king made a great feast unto all his princes and servants, the feast of Easter. Now what is this feast of Easter? Well, well first of all, we have to step back because uh, Semiramis's uh, a child, Tammuz, little baby Tammuz, which we read about in Ezekiel 8, about the women weeping for Tammuz there. Well, the little baby Tammuz uh, should have lived forever since he was a reincarnated sun god, but not so. In his 40th year, he was gored to death by a, a wild boar in a freak hunting accident. So the worshipers of the reborn sun god set aside 40 days of weeping for Tammuz, in which the sun god worshipers would deny themselves a pleasure in this life for the pleasure of Tammuz in his afterlife. And it started out with a big sex orgy, then they deny themselves a pleasure, and then at the end, when later when his mother was reincarnated as Easter, the bare breasted sex goddess, on Easter Sunday, they would roast the pig that gored Tammuz and eat ham on Easter Sunday. That's the feast of Easter. So they had a big celebration. It was the Easter celebration. Oh yes, they had the eggs all dyed red like they still do in the Greek Orthodox Church because they used to in the, uh, in the satanic worship uh, of the Canaanites. They would sacrifice, uh, first of all, they would impregnate virgins on the altar of Easter on Easter Sunday. A year later, nine months later, these, uh, these little children who are now born, and, and so nine months later, now we got three-month-old children, and these three-month-old babies are now sacrificed on the altar of Easter. They dye the eggs of Easter in the blood of sacrificed infants, and now we still keep dying Easter eggs in our churches, which is nothing but child sacrifice memorials. The Almighty said, do not learn the way of the heathen, do not learn how they worship and serve their gods and do the same thing and do it to me. It's an abomination, it is tova, it is shaket, it is utterly disgusting, putrid, wretched, and vile. And yet we do this and we say we're doing it for him? No, we are doing it as a satanically inspired rehearsal of what pagans did. For they have even burned their children in the fire to other gods. Oh, I'll tell you. So, so he got the Feast of Easter going on. And in the remainder of verse 18, he made a release to the provinces and gave gifts according to the state of the king. And when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. So this is another, uh, another role, uh, role of young virgins that are being brought in for this, but you know, the position of queen, sorry, it's been filled. Now you get to fit into the concubine mode. I guess the K 
king really liked this concept of getting all the beautiful young virgins in the empire, and then he would have his pick. We know that, uh, I think it was Solomon that had a thousand wives and concubines all together. And Solomon, that was a very small kingdom compared to <laughs> all the way from each, uh, Ethiopia to India. And so when the virgins were gathered together the second time, Mordecai sat in the king's gate. Esther had not showed her kindred nor her people, Esther didn't, as Mordecai had charged her, for Hadassah did the commandment of Mordecai like as when she was brought up with him. And in those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, listen to this, listen to what happened. See, ladies and gentlemen, we are gonna see that even though the name of the Almighty is not here, we are seeing him work behind the scenes. We are seeing him weave the entire fabric of life together. And this is where we are in this day and time. We do not see everything he's doing. But we see even those who are elected in positions of responsibility in the government in the United States and Israel, all these things are, are done and the Almighty is weaving his plan together. 4,000 years ago, the creator of the heavens and the earth made an everlasting covenant with Abraham. All the land from the Euphrates to the Nile belongs to the sons of Israel. And I will tell you, shockwaves are gonna shake the earth as heaven reaches down to fulfill that promise and every nation, every nation that stands against that promise, against that eternal covenant, will find themselves on the battlefield against the Almighty. That is why Jerusalem will be considered a burdensome stone for all nations, because this is what is coming up right now. And so listen to this. In those days, while Mordecai sat in the king's gate, two of the king's chamberlains, Bigthan and Teresh, those who kept the door, they were angry. And they sought to lay a hand on King Akashros. And the thing was known to Mordecai, who told it unto Easter, the queen. And Easter then certified the king in Mordecai's name that Mordecai came and told me this. And when inquisition was made of the matter, it was found out. Therefore, they were both hanged on a tree, and it was written in the book of the Chronicles of the King. See, even the Babylonians do what is so seldom done in the Christian and Messianic world today. Diligent inquiry was made. Deuteronomy 19 tells us about this very thing. When someone brings an accusation against someone, then at that point, they bring both of the parties are brought before the judges. And they make diligent inquiry. And if the person has made a false statement against the other, that which would have happened to the innocent party would then come upon the one making the false accusation. Unfortunately, no one, and especially as I've witnessed it in the Messianic world, even bothers reading the Torah on this. I hear there's leaders all over that, that repeat lies over and over, destroying people's lives. And they think they're some big Torah teacher, try to convince people that they're a big Torah teacher, but no, what they have done is they've negated it and they're not even doing what Mordecai then instigated in Babylon. And what is that? That diligent inquiry is made and then they hang it because they would have caused the death of the king, and now the death is coming upon them. Join us again next time as we then find out the art enemy of Mordecai and how he got put in place. Where did he come from? Because the Almighty is weaving together all of history in order to effect his plan. Now I'd like to leave you with this blessing. Yivarechecha Yahovah Baishmarecha. Yair Yahovah Panavelecha Vichonecha. Yair Yahovah Panavelecha Baisem Lecha Shalom. Bashem Yeshua HaMashiach Sar Shalom. Yahovah bless you and keep you. Yahovah make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. Yahovah lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace. Shalom Torah fans, give this video a thumbs up and share it with a friend. Tap the subscription button and the bell icon, and I promise to update weekly with in-depth biblical research.
Be sure to download the new MichaelRood.tv app for both mobile and home devices for even more commercial-free content.